All right. Shall I start, Pat? Great. So I'm going to be talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to be talking about palliative care and hospice policy. I did expand it a little bit um, regard, affecting the nurse practitioner workforce. And uh, as Pat said, I'm going to be introducing myself. I am, first of all, uh, practicing as a palliative care nurse practitioner at the University of Maryland Medical Center, the large academic. We did bring the world a long, true long wearing lipstick. And I now also work as a marketing consultant for palliative care. So I have had the oddest career, but it is wonderful and I'm I'm happy to do all of it. So while we're on the topic of messaging, I every talk that I do about palliative care, I include the favorable messaging that was evidence uh, tested, that was tested with the public by CAPSI. So if you are talking about palliative care and you're gonna have my slides, you should find ways to talk about quality of life, relief from symptoms, pain and stress, appropriate in any age and along with curative treatment, the team approach to care, providing an extra layer of support. Um, because a lot of people don't know what palliative care is, and this is a good way to ground everybody. But I'm assuming if you are coming to this talk, you know a little bit about palliative care. Now, when I now put take my messaging uh, hat off and put on my policy hat on, the good news is palliative care is really a helpful contributor for uh, all policy, but certainly federal policy. And that's because the evidence is quite consistent. And the Medicare Innovation Center just recently published a study, a synthesis of all of their palliative care models that shows that it improves care for people at equal or lower cost. And we know that that's not because we deny people things, but because once they start working with palliative care and then have a better understanding of what their options are, many, not everyone, but many people say, wow, I don't want to be in the hospital. I, I don't want to do that treatment if it's not going to really help. And so if they can get supportive care in other settings, they, they're happy to do that. It is also appropriate for an aging and chronic illness population, which is certainly what this country um, has. And as the country ages uh, and the baby boomers get older, um, it's going to be very appropriate for many of them to have right. access to palliative care. And finally, um, thinking about it a little bit politically, the focus on uh, the person, their goals and their values aligns very much with conservative or Republican goals of individual responsibility, and stewardship of resources. So that is, it, it's a very much a bipartisan uh, issue and that is a very handy thing when you go uh, on the Hill. It was wonderful when you asked me to come and do this talk because I thought, what are the policies for, for nurse practitioners in palliative care? So I actually had to kind of dig some things up. But I would, I would say, first off, nurse practitioners can do and bill for the following. Any symptom management, those are medical things. There are codes. And um, that is a lot of what I do when I see patients in the hospital. We can also uh, be uh, reimbursed for coordinating care. And coordinating care is a very important aspect of palliative care because most people with a serious illness have more than one illness and they've got a whole bunch of doctors and they've got a whole bunch of different you know, medical providers. And we can help kind of coordinate care and say, all right, overall what's going on and keep everybody uh, posted. We can charge, there are billing codes for complex clinical care, and there are billing codes for advanced care planning. So nurse practitioners are among the providers who can be reimbursed for these important conversations. I would say that we can go on and do other interventions. So I mean, even um, though a lot of the time in the hospital, I'm talking to people about maybe stopping a, a lot of medical care. Sometimes I'm ordering tests for them. Um, sometimes they want procedures or, or, and we agree that that's appropriate. So we can do those things as well. I would say that um, when I think about nurse practitioners on the palliative care team, because again, as I said earlier, it's a team-based type of care. We are very important contributors. And there was an article a number of years ago that said, if you didn't have the resources to have a real team for palliative care and you could only have one person on your team, that one person should be a nurse practitioner. Because given our holistic background, we can do the medical stuff, but we can also do the psychosocial stuff. We can do the patient and family education and support. We can even do spiritual assessments. We're kind of like, the, the broad player on the palliative care team. 
I, I said I expanded the topic a little bit to look at hospice because there were some things I wanted you to know as nurse practitioners about what we can and can't do in hospice. Now, hospice is a highly regulated industry as opposed to palliative care, which doesn't exist formally in the Medicare or Medicaid, most Medicaid programs. Um, but there is a Medicare hospice benefit and there are very specific regulations that say who, who can be on the team and what can they do. So the good news is that nurse practitioners can be the attending provider for a person. So what does that mean? Okay, if you have a patient in primary care or you have a patient and you're not seeing them as a palliative care person, or maybe even if you are, and they opt for hospice, you can be designated the person who's going to continue to work with that patient and uh, write orders and you know help make medical decisions. Um, usually a person in a hospice it has the opportunity to have another provider other than the hospice medical uh, person. And we can be that. We can also be the provider on the hospice team. So as I said, I spent the fall working in an inpatient unit for one of the Maryland's largest hospices in Baltimore. And I admitted patients to the unit. I uh, discharged patients to home. I uh, saw them, uh, I wrote notes. I ordered medications. I ordered, I ordered feeding tubes for people who were still going to live long enough that that made sense. Um, and I also was available when people called in from the home teams to make medical decisions and order things. So um, again, we can play many roles in the hospice team. Now, something we can't quite do is if you think about getting into hospice, requires still that you be designated by two physicians, physicians, not providers, that you have a terminal illness and that your life expectancy is, if everything goes according to normal course, within six months. We are not allowed to do that, nurse practitioners, that is only, nor are physician assistants, that is only physicians. And that is because we are a new, newer role and our scope of practice as it is expanded on a state level, it is also slowly expanded on a federal level, but it is not expanded here. And that is unfortunate because people who need hospice might be in places where there aren't physicians available. And so we know that this is an access to hospice uh, enrollment issue. However, once they are in hospice, a few years ago, it was changed that we could recertify them for hospice. So the process in hospice is you're enrolled, but you have to be, your case has to be reviewed after the first 60 days to see, do you still meet criteria? Do you still have a terminal illness? Is your prognosis still within six months? And then it has to be recertified for every 90 days after that. And nurse practitioners are allowed to do that once somebody else, a doctor has said that somebody can be in hospice to begin with. However, this is starting to change as well. So Medicare cannot is a huge federal program. They cannot just change things because something sounds like a good idea. And uh, our second speaker is going to talk to you about evidence and how important it is to inform policy in, in part. And so they do tests, they do demonstration models, and they have a new model. And you, when you get the slides, you'll have, these are actual links that will take you to information about that model. But this model had somewhere in the fine print, but of course I and others were looking for it, mentioned that nurse practitioners could certify in this model for terminal illness. Um, and so this is a way that Medicare is going to get data on this and see how does this work? Is this effective or not? Now you might say, well, gosh, why would you have to even test this? I mean, what we're we're providers, why can't we just do this? Well, you know, anytime Medicare expands who can do something, it costs them more money, right? So we view it from the patient standpoint. If somebody wants hospice, but there isn't a physician to certify the terminal illness, then they can't get a service that they need. But Medicare says, all right, but if you certify them, maybe more people will be enrolled in hospice. And while we know that is a good idea, hospice is not a cheap uh, program. It is actually very expensive. And so um, Medicare is aware that there is costs to just opening up access. The other thing that I will be honest and say that I've heard is some people are worried in the hospice field that nurse practitioners are gonna be a little bit too generous in saying somebody is hospice appropriate when they might not really be. 
because we're going to want the services for them, right? And we're going to say, well, he could have he could have a prognosis of six months or less. And I say to that, we're going to know more about all of that with the REACH model data, right? If it turns out that nurse practitioners were wildly inappropriate in uh, certifying people for hospice, we will learn that. And if we were in line with our physician colleagues, we will learn that in, as well, and hopefully we will move forward. I also, uh, when I thought about workforce and po palliative care policy, I thought I'd have to talk about the Pachita Act. This has been around for a while, and I can't see all of you, so I can't ask you to all raise your hands if you've heard about it, but this is a pretty nifty piece of legislation, and it's the whole thing is all about promoting interprofessional team-based training of people in palliative care. It would support training faculty, so I think this is of interest to your program and other uh, university school of nursing that have palliative care educational programs, because some of this money could go to fund the, that that faculty. Um, some of it could, su perfor, uh, could support continuing education of health professionals um, so that more people could get uh, palliative care training. It would um, provide training for uh, fellowships. And so I know that nurse practitioner fellowships could be covered under this bill. And finally, it uh, definitely, it calls out advanced education for nurses. So, I mean, specifically that would be for nurse practitioner uh, and, um, you know, uh, Clint Speck and, and other advanced uh, practice uh, programs for, for nurses. So that sounds pretty great, right? wow, this should be law. Well, yeah, but it's not. It has passed twice in the House um, in the last two sessions of Congress. So clearly people there saw the benefit, but it has never got, even gone to a vote in the Senate. And there were some issues in one of the committees about it, and I'm not sure where those stand. At the uh, Last year, we heard that it had been tossed in, along with a million other things, into the Build Back Better bill, you remember Biden was talking about this, but it was pulled out at the last minute. I don't know why it's not an expensive bill, but it was not included in the omnibus bill that passed in December. So, so it's back to the drawing board. Every congressional session, you have to start from scratch. So it, it's as if it had never been introduced, although obviously it has been introduced and people have supported and voted for it before. So maybe three's a charm, I, I don't know. We're, we're hopeful that we will get it across the finish line. Um, there, there has been, not specific to palliative care, but there has been, there was funding for a, a higher education in the omnibus bill. So there was like $3 billion for higher education, including uh, increases in the Pell Grant funding. And then there was specific money for nurse uh, education, and that it was a 6% increase over uh, the previous year. So you know, we got we got something in that bill. Um, as I look to future nurse practitioner policy opportunities for uh, in this space, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think it would be great if we can get that reach model data. It's probably another three or four years away at at, the, at best to say whether we could be allowed to certify. But I would say Medicare has been pretty good about expanding our role when they have data to support it. So if the test is successful or, or shows that that's not an issue, I would imagine this will change because I think this is in their purview. I don't think they need the legislation. A little thing, when I work in my inpatient hospice, I'm not technically the attending of record there. So I can see patients, I can write notes, but I can't bill for those encounters. And that is a problem, right? Because the, the hospice has to pay me for my time, but if they can't recoup any revenue for my billing, that isn't gonna work. And so I and another colleague filled in for a few weeks because they had a, a, a shortage in physician staff, but they have stopped that because they, 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 their revenue situation is better when physicians do it and can be reimbursed. And then finally, I think there will be more opportunities for legislation to increase NP funding. And I'm hoping that the evidence from the next speaker will be some of the evidence that can support those policies. But I did wanna end my section with just a, a, a wonderful uh, story about the impact a nurse or a nurse practitioner can have in Washington. So you have perhaps heard in the news that Bernie Sanders finally is co-chair of a major committee uh, in the in the Senate. He is co-chair of the 
Health, Education, Labor, and Pension Committee, the HELP Committee, which you got education and you got labor. So sounds like workforce clearly falls into their purview. His other chair is uh, Senator Cassidy, Bill Cassidy, who is a gastroenterologist from Louisiana. So he knows a lot about healthcare. And the, the two of them have agreed <clears throat> that they are very focused on healthcare uh, workforce. They had a um, hearing uh, a couple of weeks ago where the dean at the school, Hopkins School of Nursing, uh, Sarah Santon spoke about the importance of nursing education. And they are asking for public information. And uh, when you get these slides, the link to that is in my notes. And you, as an average citizen, you as a nurse, you as a nurse practitioner or a nurse practitioner faculty could write a letter to this committee and say why you think it would be important to um, do legislation that would increase funding for more education for nurses or nurse practitioners. But here is the rest of the story. Senator Cassidy got this idea from a uh, Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow, Dr. Brenda Baker, who was working with him last year. And he said to Politico, which is the big on the hill news outlet, I had an advanced practice nurse who's with me last Congress and left this legislation. I don't want to talk about the details, but it's something which she, as an academic advanced practice nurse, conceived of what we thought would help. So, I mean, oh my gosh, right? One person in this office, a fellow, not even a staffer, a fellow, and she's a wonderful person, she's terrific, was able to persuade them that this was enough of an issue that they should draft legislation, and now they're about to introduce it. So I'm going to just finish with a uh, update for you on my perspective on nurses in Washington. Everyone likes us. Good nurse. They like us in a kind of paternalistic way. Why is that? Well, we are not a big factor in the major health policy issues. That's where the physician associations and the lobbyists they hire are all over the place. And I saw this when I was in Pelosi's office, we did not hear much from the nursing organizations. Um, we tend to lobby for more parochial interests. I mean, things like patient staff ratios, right? I mean, that that that's an issue that, that matters to the public, but that's not something that other people can get very excited about. And so we are not often at the table. And my plea to uh, nurses when I speak to, you, uh, to them, students and pro profession, you know, practicing nurses is we need to fix that. So what can you do? First of all, you can follow health policy news. Here are some links for things that I find very helpful. You should join your professional associations because usually they tip you off. So I just got something from my state uh, nurse practitioner association that there's legislation in my state that affects my practice that I didn't even know about. And I wrote a letter. And that's the next thing. Respond to those requests. You can volunteer um, to be on committees. That's how I learned. I learned on the state level and now I work on the federal level. Uh, finally, please register and vote. It sounds like a basic thing, but this is the best way to participate in our democratic process. You can write all the letters you want, but if you don't vote, it doesn't make a lot of sense. All right. This is my contact information. I'm going to stop sharing and I am available to answer questions later. And thank you for your attention. Okay. So there, there is a one question in the chat that you might want to answer as the scene is um, pulling up her slides. And uh, it says, thank you, Dr. Marion. I can't even say your last name. <laughs> I said, to rephrase my question, the question, the question wonders, regardless of state practice authority, if you are billing Medicare and Medicaid, does your organizational credentialing require agreements? Oh, I just lost the chat. Um, so um, so the way the way it works is your state requirements trump the federal ones. So you cannot do things federal uh, for federal programs that you aren't allowed to do on a state program. So if you can't order opioids in your state, you can't do that for Medicare patients and, and bill Medicare for it. Um, so if you need if you're in a situation where you have a collaborative agreement for some of these practices, if, if advanced care planning falls under that, that yes, you would have to have uh, an agreement with a with a physician to do that. I am fortunately in Maryland, a state where we have independent practice. So I have not had to worry about these things for about 10 years. But my heart goes out to those of you in states where that's not the case. 
Thank, thank you. Uh, and Lucine. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Grand. Um, what a fantastic talk to follow and an introduction to follow. I don't have slides to introduce myself formally, but we decided to keep this informal. So uh, I am a faculty member at Columbia University School of Nursing. I've been at Columbia for about 12 years. I am also a faculty member at the Melman School of Public Health and the Department of Health Policy and Management. And I am the Executive Director for Center for Healthcare Delivery Research and Innovation, where we do several studies, mostly focus on advanced practice nurse workforce or nurse workforce in general. We have studies on hospital nurses, but mostly we look at the nurse practitioner workforce. So I, I haven't looked at the palliative care MP workforce. That's why we had Dr. Grant here to uh, provide the landscape and the issues and challenges and opportunities for MPs in a, in a palliative care. But Mostly we look at how to effectively utilize a growing nurse practitioner workforce to really deliver high quality, cost-effective safe care to patients. And uh, I have a fantastic team of trainees and colleagues who work with me. And I saw some of your names here on the, uh, on the participant list. So I'll be happy. So I've been asked to speak about MP workforce in general and how MP, um, um, how um, um, MP care and environment affect patient care and outcomes. And we heard Dr. In Dr. Grant's talk about different levels of barriers and challenges that is affecting MP workforce. And I, and, and I love the point that you mentioned that, it, it, which is accurate that state policies sometimes trumps the federal policy. What we're also learning in our work and most of my talk is going to be about that, that organizational policy sometimes trumps the state policy or federal policy. So I'm gonna to try to walk you through uh, some of these studies and show opportunities to produce evidence to really eliminate ba barriers to maximally utilize nurse practitioners. I always start my talks putting this slide together because my team and I fundamentally believe that maintaining a functional nurse workforce in highly performing healthcare organizations is going to help to meet the demand for healthcare services and assure health outcomes for all. And this is what our program of research is. Our studies are informing this. We're looking at MP nurse workforce, we're looking at organizations, we're looking at the healthcare service delivery. So particularly, most of my focus now today is going to be on, um, um, I'm trying to organize my slides better <laughs> so I don't cover my slides. So mostly about nurse practitioner workforce. And Dr. Grant gave a fantastic background about uh, MP workforce and current, current policy challenges facing MPs. But one thing is for sure that MP workforce is growing. Their numbers have been doubling in the past. It is the fastest growing uh, workforce of primary care providers now. And the projections show that they're gonna double uh, between 2018 and 2030. So, uh, and um, we know that primary care in the US is being delivered by physicians, physician assistants, and nurse practitioners. And um, by 2025, about one third of all primary care providers are going to be nurse practitioners. And we know that due to demographic shifts, increased the burden of chronic diseases and serious illness, the demand for palliative care service is going to increase. And Dr. Grant made a fantastic case for MP workforce to really play a key role to helping meet the demand for palliative care services. Yet, we also heard very clearly and loudly the challenges facing nurse practitioner workforce that really uh, prohibits MPs from maximally contributing patient care. We heard federal barriers, the billing issue is a the incident to billing is, um, or in certain cases, not being to be able to deliver uh, bill for services is an issue that really affects how MPs are able to provide care, how they're able to be utilized by their organizations uh, to deliver services that they're able and capable of doing. We also heard about scope of practice issues. We know that scope of practice that governs nurse practitioner practice varies from state to state. Same care that MPs can provide in one state, they're not able to deliver exactly the same care next door because the state policy is prohibiting them. Why did I highlight the organizational barrier here? Because what we are learning that very often organizations determine what MPs can do and cannot do, even in states that have a full scope of practice. 
And we heard that, you know, often state policy trumps the federal. We're noticing and the evidence is fundamentally growing that practices are creating restrictions on MP practice, not effectively utilizing the advanced skills and um, competencies of MPs. Uh, and that's where we should be able to intervene. And one of the things that, you know, I, I don't say we should not intervene at federal or state level because uh, we ha have to have created a, you know, a policy environment where MPs can provide care, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of efforts. And very often, as we see all these bills being, you know, uh, not getting, uh, uh, you know, um, the outcome we hope for. So what can we do as a researcher, as, a, you know, advocates is producing evidence and trying to work with healthcare administrators at local level, at organization level to really address some of the challenges. So most of my work is going to show how important organizations are in terms of hiring and retaining MPs and also promoting their uh, full scope of practice within the organization. And I think there's an opportunity in addition to working with policymakers, we also have to work with healthcare administrators and organizations. So most of my team's writing has been on organizations. So I will give you a few examples why we believe organizations are important and how we're measuring organizations. So when we started getting into this work, there was not a good instrument to really measure. What do we mean by organizations? So we developed, we received funding from AHRQ and developed an instrument called Nurse Practitioner Primary Care Organizational Climate mm -hmm. Questionnaire that is capable of measuring the organizational climate of nurse practitioners. Is this a good place for you as a nurse practitioner to practice, be able to deliver patient care? What is this instrument doing is asking MPs 29 items, which are grouped in uh, four subscales. They're asking about MP and physician relations. Um, uh, do you practice as a team? Do you collaborate together to deliver patient care? It is asking about, do you have enough support within your organizations to be able to practice independently and according to your scope of practice? One of the important things that it also measures is the relationship between MPs and administrations. And because what we're learning previous studies that inform the development of this instrument is that very often organizational management has more impact on how MPs are utilized within the organization than physicians. And also this term professional visibility came from nurse practitioners themselves. This measures how well MP role is understood within organizations. What we were learning in our work was that many practices, many healthcare organizations were hiring nurse practitioners, but they really didn't know how to effectively utilize MPs' advanced skill set and competencies because very often these MPs were the first clinician who was ever hired in that practice. And practice managers and physicians really didn't know what working with an MP really meant. So and, and that and that was critically important for MPs and also how MP skills were used. Very often we're hearing in a qualitative study, like you're a nurse, right? You can do this. And uh, the tasks that have been delegated to MPs were more of an RN-like task rather than using their advanced skill set. And what we are also learning in subsequent study that MPs do not like working in this type of environment. It was affecting their job satisfaction and their turn and it was affecting their turn. <coughs> And uh, we, you know, <coughs> the very early study we did in one state, we surveyed nurse practitioners. And what we learned from this study is that if MPs are not able to practice, don't have a support for their independent practice, they're not telling us good uh, that they have a good relationship with physicians and administrators, and the role was not really understood, and they heard about 20% a uh, uh, higher risk of uh, leaving their jobs and being dissatisfied. And I think COVID-19 really kind of highlighted for us now how important it is to keep clinicians in their clinical positions. And one of the issues that we're very much interested in um, workforce outcomes of MPs, especially in primary care, because we're noticing trends of MPs leaving primary care as well. So this was an early study that started telling us that if we really wanna keep MPs within their organizations, then we have to focus uh, in their clinical practices, we need to focus on the organizational climate of nurse practitioners. We expanded this study in six states because that one was from a one state study. It was like, is this a common thing? Is this what we are noticing? And the same results, uh, we noticed the same results in six states. We surveyed about you know, 1,200 nurse practitioners or about in 2,000 primary care practices. 
MPs completed uh, the, the questionnaire that we developed, MPPCOCQ, and we found that if MPs work in clinical settings where they don't have a good relationship with administrators, their job dissatisfaction increase, uh, their job satisfaction increased by four, four times if they're working in a good environment uh, with their administrators. So, uh, and we also noticed that uh, work, the organizational climate of the practices that hire and retain uh, higher MPs are critically important. And, you know, those of us who study workforce uh, res uh, you know, outcomes, these are uh, critical measurements of well-being of the workforce. And we're seeing all this, you know, um, workforce well-being, uh, workforce well-being that is important, you know, key challenge affecting the healthcare system. But what we are also very interested, you know, after that, we did multiple studies and we're consistently showing that organizational policy very often trumps the state policy, federal policy. And if MPs work in a good environment, they're able to kind of practice the fullest extent of their uh, education and, and, and training. But what we're also very much interested in is, okay, MP uh, organizational climate affects MPs. Does it also affect patient care and outcomes? And we're particularly interested in a chronic care delivery because as Marianne mentioned, MPs are able to not only deliver the uh, disease-specific care, but they're also able to coordinate care. They're also deliver psychosocial aspects of care, educate, and we made an argument that that's what chronic disease, effective chronic disease management really requires. So we published a paper in medical care in 2018 where we had a survey data from nurse practitioners from about 163 primary care practices. From the same practice, we also obtained the patient data on asthma, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. But these are uh, measures of quality of care. And we had a practice identifiers, both uh, for in the MP survey data and in the in the patient outcome data, the clinical uh, performance data set, to see if MP organizational climate or work environment really affects the quality of care delivery for these patients within the same practices. This is one of our tables of regression models. We saw two uh, significant findings. We what we found was that odds of receiving recommended service for asthma management, the first red column, you know, the row, um, it almost doubled with one standard deviation increase in organization level MP administration relations. So what we're finding that patients with asthma were able to get a better care if MPs were telling us they, you know, the, um, this aspect of the work environment was uh, uh, effective in their practices. Similarly, we also found that if MPs are able to practice independently, then the odds of receiving recommended screening for CVD increased by almost 60%. So we didn't find effect on for diabetes because then when we're looking at the diabetes measure, the practices were very similar. So there's are not a lot of diversity how practices were delivering it at a diabetes care. So, so yeah, so our conclusion from this study was that Organizational climate is not only important for MPs, but it's also important for patients, chronically ill patients who receive care this, uh, um, in, in these practices. But the goal of our research has always been effectively how we can effectively utilize nurse practitioners to eliminate health disparities. Because we know that MP role was originally designed to really address health disparities. And a few years ago, we developed this model called Nurse Practitioner Health Disparities Model, and we're showing the mechanism through which we have to intervene uh, to really uh, inc increase MP supply and improve the practice, potentially improve primary care capacity, and eliminate health disparities. As you see, you know, in, in our model, we're discussing about ex scope of practice regulation, reimbursement policies, MP work for diversity, and of course, MP work practice and environment. Organizations are critically important. This conceptual framework guided several of our R01 studies. And in one of our, our R01 study, we use this framework to say, if we effectively utilize MPs and improve their work environments, then we will be able to prevent unnecessary use of acute care services. Okay, what we did in this study, which was published a um, few months ago, last year, um, what we did in this study, we surveyed about 1,200 nurse practitioners and we obtained, um, obtained um, uh, Medicare claims data from about 450 chronically ill Medicare beneficiaries who are receiving care 
in these practices uh, where MPs work. So, I, and, and, I, and we can discuss a lot about the challenges of using Medicare claims data to really study nurse practitioner workforce, given incident to billing, but despite all these limitations, our methodology was addressing uh, some of the existing weaknesses, but Medicare is a uniform data that is available across the country. And, and so what we found that if MPs work in favorable work environments, then unnecessary use of acute, uh, we can prevent uh, unnecessary use of acute care services or chronically ill patients, because we showed that Chronically ill patients do not need to go to EDs or hospitals for conditions that can be, if properly managed in primary care, can be prevented. And we know that there are ambulatory care sensitive hospitalizations, ambulatory care sensitive uh, ED visits that if patients receive proper primary care from primary care nurse practitioners, then we'll be able to um, do um, prevent acute care use. In the subsequent paper, we also show that if patients receive care in organizations that have highest quality work environment for nurse practitioners, in those environments, black patients had similar odds of hospitalization as white patients. So if the clinic is really has a good environment for MPs, we did not notice a disparity in hospitalization between black and white patients. But if the practice did not have a good environment, we noticed that Black, lowest care environments for uh, practices, black patients had higher odds of hospitalization than white patients. So through our work, not only we have shown that MP work environment is important for MP outcomes, burnout, job satisfaction, turnover, we've published several papers about this. It is important for quality of care, like the process measures, you know, medication management for asthma, CVD screening for cardiovascular diseases, it's important for preventing acute care use, and it's also important for reducing health disparities. So we really need to strengthen practices that, that uh, employ and uh, utilize MPs as care providers. One thing that will have a major implications for palliative care is, uh, is um, caring for per uh, persons living with dementia. So we may, we, you know, in one of our R1 studies, uh, uh, we made an argument that uh, dementia is a chronic condition and MPs are ideally suited to take care of these patients. But we still don't know how to effectively utilize nurse practitioners to really deliver dementia care. Of course, we put all of our arguments in a paper that we published in American Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry and uh, saying that we need to really effectively utilize growing nurse practitioner workforce to care for aging population living with dementia. Terry Fulmer and David Rubin put a very nice editorial agreeing with our statements that indeed nurse practitioners and dementia care are a perfect fit. So we have to really look into this. But I think this is where um, we need to also kind of combine how to deliver better care to aging population, those who need have palliative care needs and dementia, uh, uh, persons living with dementia. So what we're doing in our studies, as you know, we are looking at mechanisms through which MP workforce can maximally contribute to delivering continuity care to persons living with dementia, to really keeping these patients outside of hospitals and preventing unnecessary use of ED visits and hospitalizations. What we're finding in our studies is that multiple acute care encounters are not beneficial for persons living with dementia, are not beneficial for older adults, uh, and really increase the risk of negative outcomes and, 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 and cause harm. So I think we fundamentally believe that the growing MP workforce is key for really achieving national health priorities. They're you know, caring for elderly, cutting costs because you know, acute care use and really um, uh, meeting the demand for care. We know that you know, some of my fantastic mentees are looking at access to care issues in rural areas where many patients and older adults don't have care. We know that uh, growing population of older adults has multiple chronic conditions and MPs are fantastic at coordinating and managing these conditions. Uh, and, and another team member is looking at that. And MP role was designed to help the, our country to meet the um, achieve health equity. So if we figure out how to effectively utilize MPs with a very much emphasis on their care environment, where are these MPs? Where are they delivering this care? How can we work with the practice leadership to really 
maximally utilize MPs in, at a local level, while at the same time, effort should be invested in removing barriers at state level, at federal level. So I think this is what I have for you today. We haven't done this work alone. I have and I have a fantastic team of collaborators who, and I saw some of their names on the chat as well. My mentees, they're simply the best and my mentors who you know helped me to, uh, uh, to learn a lot. And of course, these organizations who supported our work. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. And I hope this is what you're looking for, Dr. Stone. <laughs> I, I think this is a really, really uh, great presentation from both of you. Are there any questions that anybody wants to ha have? I mean, I when I think about the the practice environment, you know, and the organizational climate, as that, and, you know, Marion, I'd like to get your your in, input on that as a practicing NP. Um, you know, because it really is, you know, showing that sometimes even though you get scope of practice, oh, we got Abe's got something, but even sometimes you get scope of practice, the organization doesn't allow you because of attitudes. Do, yeah, do you have I, any? I, I, well, I mean, you know, I, I think it is true in general, and I have worked a long time in many different environments. Um, that you are most effective in 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 support of positive environments, right? You you can't be a good bricklayer if you work in a crap organization where people treat you badly. Um, and and I I think you know the challenge for for nurses and nurse practitioners is we are not the people who are powerful in these organizations, right? You you take a job somewhere and it sounds good and then it might not be, and you have to figure that out. Now, the good news is we are in, there is such desperate need for us that we can go wherever we need to go. And, I, you know, I, I have, I'm not sure how many palliative care nurse practitioners there are. There are probably about 4,000 of us who have that specific certification. Maybe it's a little more. And we are in high demand. So mm -hmm. I tell people who are miserable where they are that they should go somewhere else because, you know, I, unless you think you can fix it and maybe you can, but if you can't go somewhere where you're better appreciated because you will be happier and your care will be now, now I have data that says your care will be better. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Ab, you, you had a question? Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, pulling uh, this wonderful talk together and Marianne and Lucine for, for such uh, thoughtful presentations. So I guess the question is a broader one for the field, right? So there are currently, I counted up last year, there were two, uh, 256 new certified palliative care and uh, advanced practice uh, providers could be CNS in some states, not in New York where it doesn't exist. Many of whom are probably trained by Dorothy Wollahan, who's also here. Um, and, and so that doesn't seem like that is meeting the workforce needs for the seriously ill population. And the LACE model treats palliative care as a specialization. So it's not particularly simple in how you would train uh, to, to grow this number. I'm curious um, what thoughts you have around workforce development that might, you know, be actionable things to try and address some of some of this, you know, big gap that I think exists. Well, I, I would say that, so I'm in a state where I have independent practice, but my state does not recognize my palliative care certification. I have to maintain my critical care, my acute care nerd and certification. And I'm able to do that because I work in the hospital. So I'm in an acute care setting, but I have to have this, I have to have the continuing education credits. I have to have, you know, all of the stuff for both things. Now I'm still very interested in acute care and that works for me, but I have had colleagues where this has been a problem who they only had the palliative care certification and then they want to work in Maryland, they can't. They don't have another NP certification in one of the basic LACE models. So I, I think that was an unfortunate decision and I'm not sure how we as a field address that. I know that they wanted to focus in on the key ones, but but there are, I, I mean, I work with terrific nurse practitioners who've been nurse practitioners for decades who cannot work in Maryland now because of that, that requirement. Dorothy wants to chime in. <laughs> 
Okay, Lucy, did you have any other comments on that? Or I'm, 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 I mean, no, not go ahead okay. because. Yeah. Uh, Dor Dorothy is. Did you want have something that you wanted to say? You're on mute. Oh, you're on mute now. I got, okay. I got volunteered there. I see Mar Marlene has her hand up, and she's in the educator world too. So I think she might be wanting to pipe in, Marlene. Yeah. I actually have two things to pipe in. Um, we actually recognize this at Columbia and, you know, there are so few fellowships out there to train nurse practitioners. And I was fortunate enough to do a fellowship. We really thought about this at Columbia and we developed a certificate of palli uh, uh, advanced practice palliative care education that is open to experienced nurse practitioners across the country. And it's an online version that they can get the fellowship didactic curriculum in and still keep their jobs. Mm -hmm. And the majority of our students are interested in taking the palliative care skills back into their home environment, either oncology, mm -hmm. critical care. So this was one of our creative models. Um, and I think Dorothy is doing something similar. I think we realize in New York, there's you know, five jobs for every one of us. <laughs> And we, we have a great need, especially in the community. So that's our creative model. The one question I wanted to ask to Lucene and to Marion um, is, you know, I was always educated that when you do incident two billing, that Medicare data is not captured. And I struggle with this and people tell me, no, 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 it's out there. And it's not in my mind. And I think it's really important from a policy perspective to make sure that um, new providers are aware of the importance of advocating for independent billing. It, they are, that billing is captured in Medicare data and helps with National Health Service Corps scholarships, like all this information that Medicare pulls from. If I'm wrong, just let me know, but I keep getting told by institutions that that's not true. And I learned from Mary Mundinger that that was how it was collected. So, um, yeah, uh, so I, I, had, I had also a comment about a um, palliative care fellowship, and then I'll go to this question, Marlene. Yeah. One few years ago, a colleague of mine, we wrote a paper about a postgraduate education and advanced practice nursing, and we kind of contacted all um, fellowship programs and residences in the country. We found 37 fellowships, and only five of them were for palliative care. So I think most of the fellowships were not about palliative care. So I think um, so that's on that point. You know, me me Medicare incident two is a big issue for those of us who use Medicare claims to study MP workforce. So indeed, um, what incident two billing basically does is that MP bills under physicians MPI because rather than their own MPI, so uh, because in that case, the practice can get 100% instead of 85% of the fee. So MP can deliver the same care as a physician, but Medicare reimburses the MPs at 85% of the physician fee, which means in a Medicare claims, you can see a physician who saw 400 patients in one day. <laughs> so the, oh, that doesn't, so, but, but, uh, so that, that's the biggest issue for us. Uh, we try to address it methodologically. Sometimes we use, so in, in one model, we only use patients that are we can link to an MP, we can actually attribute to MP. But then we also have a secondary sample that we take all patients in the practice that are work with MPs and we look at a practice level out, outcomes. We basically aggregate the patient level to the practice level saying, hey, we know MP is here. We know MP works in a team-based care model maybe, but we don't, we can't find this MP in the Medicare claims. Um, uh, so we believe that MPs attribute, contribute to practice level outcomes. So, and very often we find similar results, whether, uh, and, and uh, that's kind of second, and like a sensitivity testing for us that's saying, yes, uh, we're aware of these limitations, methodologically we're trying to address, but, um, um, but it's, it, it's a huge issue. Yeah. It, and it also affects how practices hire MPs and it, um, and, you know, small practices very often, they just don't, they say, well, I don't want to lose 15% of an income if, you know, my physician can just uh, put the billing on. 
Um, so yeah, so I, that's exactly how we address it. But it's it's a very accurate issue, and it's still uh, you know affecting uh, MPs. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, Dorothy, you had another um, yeah, I, question. Thank you. I do. I will pipe in with just a few comments now that I I let Marlene have her talk. And thank you very much, both of you, for this great presentation. And my good friend Mary, and it's good to see you. Um, in terms of workforce development and training more and educating more NPs who are palliative specialists, this is a big, big problem. As we can see, programs are even closing in the master's degree programs around the country as as the credit crunch gets bigger and people go right to DMPs. So we've tried at NYU where I am, we have had a post master's program for a long time, but we have clinical hours attached to it. One of the problems with online education in nursing is cross state reciprocity and getting people out of state from New York to get their clinical hours in has been a headache. And that's why you see Marlene and I, I commend you on your new program, Marlene, good luck with all of that. Um, trying to do these kinds of programs without any clinical hours, which of course provides its own challenges and it's, it's not you know, the perfect solution. The two solutions that I, I see happening or having potential is this development of pro fellowship programs that we talked about. But fellowship programs are for the most part in many institutions done for recruitment. You, you, you would get these fellows, your MP fellows, and then so you can hire them and you get workforce. And, and in MP and in palliative care, where there are not huge numbers of NP in palliative care in every institution, that's why we have so few. I think we need to get funding for fellowships that will train, will, pro, will um, encourage you to train a, an NP specialist who can go somewhere else besides your hospital, but you need funding to do that and get it out. Um, what they're starting to do in the VA system where I work is merging geriatric fellowships with palliative care fellowships because they can get the funding and the for geri above palliative care. So that's something maybe we should be partnering with our geriatric mm. colleagues a little bit more for some funding. And then lastly, of course, we are starting more and more to integrate palliative care throughout all of the curriculum to improve the primary mm. palliative care skills of everybody. And that's um, that's a big push and an important one on, on so many levels. So that's mm -hmm. my two cents. Thanks for listening. Yeah, it, we, we've done the same at, at Columbia. I don't know if uh, um, Marlene or Penny want to speak about that, but yeah, palliative care is at all levels in, in our curriculum mm -hmm. um, without a yeah. doubt. We, we have primary palliative care integrated in the entry to practice, the MDE program and then specialty palliative care woven actually throughout our DNP competencies. It's actually a competency for uh, the DNP portfolio. And we've been fortunate here at Columbia, we also have a palliative care fellowship for a DNP or post DNP student um, in collaboration with our partners throughout the city, mostly within the CUIMC network that we allow um, a fellow to do part-time so that if they're interested in working as an NP part-time and doing a fellowship, it gives them the ability to maintain a normal salary in New York City because many fellowships are not very low below the market rate for NP practice. Yeah. yeah. Other Questions, other thoughts? Victoria says in the chat, the training to prepare MP, NPs to practice at other hospitals is very needed. I'm not quite sure what, what Victoria, what you were thinking. Uh, oh, uh, I, I was responding to Dorothy, how she was saying, like, I, I know where I work, people are very much prepared to work in this hospital system, but I think we struggle to prepare, like, our nurses and our nurse practitioners to go out and build palliative care programs and work in them in different facilities. Oh. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that I think of is, you know, the palliative care teams and that mm. in primary care and the need for them in primary care because, you know, we're doing it better in hospitals, um, you know, and we have well developed teams, but, you know, it, it, the people in the community you know, before they get to the hospital. Um, we need to do that. Um, Ma Marianne, you had something? Well, Pat, I was going to exactly say that, you know, the, I think the hospital palliative care field is fairly well filled in, but the big opportunity and what we spend a lot of time in the policy world is 
is community-based palliative care, home-based palliative care, which is a very different environment. I, I, had, I had a program in, in North Carolina, a rural program say, Dr. Grant, please come and mentor our students for two weeks. And I said, guys, I am a creature of the hospital. I, I don't know nothing about you know driving to people's homes and providing care there. That is a very different environment. And so that is kind of where we, we would like, I think where people want care and where care needs to be delivered, but that will require very different training. And I'm, I'm very uh, aware of that. Yeah, and we have uh, Jingjing does home health care research, mm -hmm. and, and uh, we work a lot with the Zinger Services of New York. I, I don't know if anybody wants to talk about the palliative care. Margaret, if you want to talk briefly, we got two seconds about the palliative care um, or Jingjing. But th they have a demonstration product. Go ahead, Margaret. Uh, we do I have a CMS demonstration uh, project going on at VNS Health with uh, nurse practitioners, and it's it's for the managed care plans, the MLTC programs, and being able to, uh, you know, maximize the benefit to see if it should be integrated across the country. Um, and, and people are taking advantage of it and wanting to have certainly, you all know, palliative care at home. So, but uh, yeah, it does take some special, special people to do that. Yeah. Lucine, let's give you the last thing. No, I'll yeah, yeah. just say hey, last thing. One, Buzz, I really like the comment about how uh, organization change. Uh, if, if an MP, you leave one organization, you're not really prepared to practice another. But also, organization takes some responsibilities away as well. We've we've met MPs in our qualitative studies that were not allowed to do physical assessment after they changed their job. Like I've been doing this for twelve years. And also, I absolutely agree that care is moving to home, and we haven't actually R21, where we're looking home-based primary care delivered by MPs, and Ab is consulting us on that, how I learned how to do that. So I think, uh, and thank you for inviting me. <laughs> so I, since I thank, thank you both. It's great speakers, um, and you know, this will be recorded, and, the, and if you want the slides, um, just email us at the Center for Health Policy. Um, and we'll make sure you get them. And then the last thing is um, we're really looking forward to April 4th. Um, this will be an in-person event um, with lunch. So those of you that are in New York and want to come or close by, um, but we'll also it will be a hybrid, but you can also do it via Zoom. And um, so we have a keynote and moderator is uh, Billy Rosa. Uh, Tamarin Gray is coming down from um, Harvard. Gary Stein is coming over um, and Leah Estrada to talk about multicultural issues in palliative care. This is our last workshop because we're, we'll be funded for a lot. We'll still be doing things through the Center for Health Policy, but SIPC is not going to get more funding. And also at this um, workshop, Betty Farrell um, will be there as a participant. We've Betty Farrell is on April 3rd giving a lecture, which it will be a hybrid event too in person um, for a CUMIC-wide event. So she's coming in for that lecture, the Alexander Ming Lectureship, and she'll also get, attend this event. So we hope you all could come. Love to see you in person there. If not, please just put it on your, on your um, calendars and come up via, um, via Zoom. So thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.